We're going to talk about Hanukkah tonight, and I'm really excited to do this. There's, there's a few times a year where I get to, uh, to you know, share some of my passions. And one of my passions, and you guys know this, is, is that I believe that we have a beautiful heritage as believers. And that heritage is, is our Jewish roots, our Hebrew roots, that our entire faith is built upon a foundation that pre-existed before you know, the New Testament came along. And the patriarchs, and the prophets, and the, the writings, and, and uh, the, the Torah. It was the, it's the foundation by which we were given the Messiah. And not only the Messiah, but the beautiful truths and scriptures. And so I get a chance to share from time to time when we're on a, in, in a season where that's being celebrated. Now, as you know, we already told you, we're talking about Hanukkah tonight. And the reason we're talking about Hanukkah tonight, because it's the 25th of Kislev. Did you realize that? <laughs> Probably didn't know that, did you? Well, 25th of Kislev is, a, is the, uh, the Hebrew month of Kislev. And that's the prescribed start of the dedication of the Feast of, uh, of um, Lights, or the Feast of Dedication, however you want to call it. Hanukkah, meaning dedication. And it's three months after Rosh Hashanah, so we're three months into the New Year. We celebrated Rosh Hashanah, the, the New Year, back in September. And what we do here is, well, at least in our house, what we do is we spin the dreidel, and we light the candles, and menorah, our kids get presents every, every night of the week, and that's two kids, so it's 16 presents have to be wrapped and prepared, and we eat a lot of spagayot and, and latkes, fried food, you know, <laughs> and so um, the, it's a beautiful time. Now, this is not one of the prescribed Hebrew feasts that you read about in Leviticus. Uh, this is something new that they, um, you know, they celebrated after the temple was destroyed and then rebuilt and then desecrated and then rededicated. It's an eight-day feast, and it, it's, it lasts for eight, actually, nights. And you see this Hanukkah, which is a Hanukkah menorah. Someone asked me earlier that is a, is a menorah always with four candles on each side and one in the middle. And no, a standard menorah would have three on each side and one in the middle. But the Hanukkah menorah for Hanukkah is for Hanukkah, and it's, it's celebrating the miracle that we'll talk about in just a few moments, of the light and the dedication of the temple. Um, one of the things that we have to realize is that this story of Hanukkah, even the, the story of the Maccabees, is not in the Old Testament, and it's not in the New Testament. It takes place in the intertestamental period. There was time between the last writing of the Hebrew Scriptures and the first writing of the New Testament. We call that intertestamental. Some people will call it that. Uh, but there were books written. There were books that we know as the Apocrypha, um, usually not in the Protestant Bible as inspired books, although revered as, as holy works, or at least in, uh, works from great Hebrew men and, and cultures uh, that were brought forth. Most Bibles, you know, uh, before, I don't know what the year was, before the, the great Protestant uh, Reformation did include the Apocrypha. And one of the books in the Apocrypha was the Book of Maccabees. And Maccabees tells the story of Hanukkah. It tells the story of what took place when uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and these, these uh, Greek um, godless pagans took over the Holy Temple. And this all took place around, around 167 BC, so about 163 years before Jesus was born. It was during this Second Temple period. It was during a period where some people say the prophets were silent because there wasn't a current prophet. At least it wasn't being written. And, and it wasn't. sometimes they call that the silent years, although I don't believe God is ever silent. But in this void, after Alexander the Great conquered Judea, and he, he set up a, a succession of, of rulers, one of them came along and named Antiochus IV. And he later called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, you know, which means that you know, he, he, it was the presence of God. He was a, kind of a heady kind of guy. But something took place where he decided to turn on the Jews. And that's not uncommon. There's a spirit of anti-Semitism that, that runs rampant throughout history. And at some point somewhere, someone will turn on the Jews and mark them for destruction. And that's exactly what he did. He saw that they were celebrating and worshiping in the Holy Temple. And they had priests and they had a faith in, the, in what they called the one true God. And he went there and he, 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 he killed the priests. And he, he took, ransacked the temple, took all the gold and used that for himself. And then he went and, and, and desecrated the temple. And it's written that he desecrated by slaughtering a pig in the holy place. You know, pigs are not <laughs> permitted anywhere near the temple, let alone pig's blood on the altar. And you, you can imagine how this made the, the Jews of that day feel. And there was a family of Jewish 
brothers, Judah, Maccabee, and his five brothers, all sons of Matthias. And they were somewhat zealots. They were not going to stand for this. <laughs> and against all odds, they decided to, to set out and, and, and attack the Greek army, a very powerful army that had, had made a fortress there on Mount Zion, there where the temple is, and to go ahead and, and take it back, recapture the temple. And that was really a first miracle because though they were incredibly outnumbered, they were able to recapture the temple. And they cleansed it as much as they could, and they rebuilt it with, with fresh hewn stones, and then they had to rededicate. Now, when you rededicate the temple, they, the only thing they could think about on how to dedicate a temple is to go back in 2 Chronicles 7 when Solomon built the temple in the first place. And what did he do to dedicate the temple? And what he did was he, he lit the menorah for eight days and, and prayed and, and the Lord's presence was in that place. And so they decided that that's what needed to be done. They needed to dedicate this temple. The problem, according to tradition, now this again is not from the Bible, it's not even from the book of Maccabees, it's, a, it's some ancient scriptures that talk about this, that they only had oil for one night. Only had oil, and this is, it wasn't a, a candle menorah, it was big oil lamps, and, and particularly the, the everlasting lamp was supposed to stay lit, and they had enough for one night. And they, they said, well, at least we'll get it for once, one night, but miraculously it lasted another night, and it lasted another night, and you know how the story goes, and, and eventually it lasted for eight days, and, and they felt that that was enough to dedicate the temple. And that's where they came up with the phrase, Nez Gadol Hayasham, Nez Gadol Hayasham. A great miracle has happened there. If you're in, in uh, Israel, you say Nez Gadol Hayapo. Did you know that? And that's a great miracle that's happened here. In fact, if you look at a dreidel, there's four sides to a dreidel. I don't know if we have a picture of a dreidel, but if you have, what is that? Oh, eight nights. Oh, thank you, guys. <laughs> Real-time graphics. I love these girls. Um, that's a menorah. But if you look at a dreidel, you know, the spinning top, there's four signs, and, and there's four Hebrew letters on a dreidel. Do you know what they are? They have nun. They have uh, hey, which is another Hebrew letter. They have gadol uh, and uh, gimel, and they have uh, shem. And, and Shin. And those are the four letters that stand for Nez Gadol Hayasham. Just a little trivial fact there. To remember the statement that a great miracle has happened here. So, when I look at this and I think, this is great. This is beautiful. And some of it's tradition. Some of it is folklore. Some of it's from ancient writings. But what does it mean to us? What does it mean to, to, to us as Christians, as believers in Jesus? And, and why should we even care about this? And the answer to that, why should we care about this, is because Jesus did. It's because Jesus did. And we see it on the 25th of Kislev. Jesus is in Jerusalem. We'll look at that in a second. And if you look at Jesus' life, you have to remember something, and this will help you guys so much in understanding the life of Jesus, understanding the cultural context, why he did what he did and said what he did, is that Jesus was Jewish. Not only was he Jewish, he was very Jewish. If he was alive today, you would consider him an Orthodox Jew, someone that was completely adherent, someone that, that I don't know what he would, would have looked like in modern day, but I guarantee he would have dressed like someone who is as Jewish as anybody that you've ever met, maybe even with the paya and the black coat and whatever, because he was from this, he, he was largely considered a rabbi. In fact, he was called upon to speak in the synagogue in Luke 4. Uh, when, when Nicodemus in John chapter 3 came to talk to him, now, Nicodemus was a known Pharisee, and he went and talked to Jesus, not as just some carpenter, not just some common man. He said, he said, Rabbi, whom God sent to teach us, I ask you, how can a man be born again? Or whatever that transpired. Also, when, you know, when he was arrested, the chief priests and the Pharisees and, and the Sanhedrin, they, they, they decided to try him and, and look at his life and see where did he go against our law? Where was he not adhering? Where was he not observing? And they found nothing. So Jesus really was as Jewish as you possibly could be. And part of the being Jewish then and even today is to keep the feasts, particularly the, the three main feasts, the pilgrimage feasts of Pesach, Passover, Shavuot, which is Pentecost, and, and, and uh, Feast of Tabernacles. But Jesus did even more than that. And, and I believe that, that um, when he set this example 
as being the Jewish Messiah, it was not just to, to propagate Judaism, it was to open the doors for all to come in in fulfillment of many prophecies that the Gentiles would come to the light. Now what about the, the apostles? You might say, well, Jesus, okay, that's good for Jesus, but isn't it true that, that you know, the apostles were, even though they were Jewish, you know, Pentecost happened and they sort of just jettisoned their Jewishness after Pentecost? No, that's not what happened. In fact, if you look at it, Acts chapter 2 was Pentecost. It was an amazing day, right? They were celebrating, first of all, they're celebrating Pentecost, which it didn't start there. It was an annual feast called Shavuot, 50 days after Passover. Every year they'd probably be in Jerusalem celebrating Pentecost. This one was special because the Holy Spirit, you know, fell upon them and the incredible things happened. And the church is exploded by thousands and thousands that day of people coming to faith in Messiah and being baptized. Probably mostly Jewish people. Who else is celebrating, you know, a high Jewish feast in Jerusalem at the time? <laughs> not, probably not a lot of Gentiles. But then what happened after that? And some people say, well, then they stopped all this Jewish nonsense and they just started becoming Christians. And that's not entirely true. Uh, if you look at the very next chapter, Acts chapter 3, it starts out where they, they woke up and... Peter and John went to, up together, it says, into the temple at the hour of prayer on the ninth hour. So what did they do in Acts chapter 3? They went right back to the temple as they normally would. But this time, they're preaching the gospel. This time, they healed a man that was at the gate beautiful. This time, they were filled with the power of God. And you see, even as the church grew, it was observant to these holidays, but no longer did it hold to these holidays as a means for salvation. And that is key. Are you with me? No longer did they, did they have to bring sacrifices to the temple to have their sins forgiven because Jesus was the one and only true sacrifice for their sins. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple, which is the separation between outside and the holy place, whoosh, was ripped in half. And that was symbolic of now God has access to his presence to everyone. And from that, that point on, you see Gentiles coming. So you see people that weren't even born Jewish coming and saying, I found the Jewish Messiah. You may be one of those. And that's the beautiful thing about the scripture being fulfilled and, and others coming to the light of God, into relationship with God the Father. Even as it goes on, Paul comes on the scene. Paul was, a, <laughs> he was like probably one of the worst, you know, adversaries that the early church had. He was like a mean Pharisee who, who delighted in seeing Christians killed because they believed in Jesus. His name was Saul of Tarsus. And he was smart, he was young, and he was mean. And then the Lord got a hold of him and completely transformed him. And so he went from being persecuted, persecuting the church to being persecuted because he was in the church. And uh, he became a leader, as you know, of the early church. Apostle Paul wrote most of the doctrine that we consider Christian doctrine in his letters in the, uh, in the New Testament. And at one point late in Acts, in Acts chapter 24, and this is important, we get to see what they thought of Paul. They get to, we get to see what the outsiders thought of this movement that you and I know as Christianity. And what did they think about it? Well, how did they define it? And I'm speaking of the, the, the high priests and the Jews, other Jews, and I'm thinking of the Romans. And there's this little verse in Acts chapter 24, verse 5. And it's, it's when Tertullus, who is a lawyer for the high priest, and he's coming to speak to Felix, who's a Roman governor, about Paul. Okay, so now the Jews are ostracizing the, the Jewish believers that call themselves, at this point, they call themselves Nazarenes, a sect of Judaism known as Nazarenes. Why? Because it's these Jews that believe Jesus was the, you know, the, the prophetic Messiah, that Jesus of Nazareth was the one, the anointed one, the holy one of Israel. All right, so, so that's who the Jews identify. That's who, if you were a believer in those days, you would have said, well, I believe Jesus is Messiah. So here's what, the, what happens in Acts 24, verse 5. We found a man, he's saying to Felix, the, the Roman governor, to be a troublemaker. This man is stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. And he's the ringleader of a Jewish sect known as the Nazarenes. Now why is that important? What it shows is the identity of the early church. This is the identity of the people that you and I love and love to read about, Peter and James and John and now Paul. The identity of these people, late in Acts, as the church is spreading into Thessalonica and Colossae and, and, and you know, Galatia and all over, that the mindset is it's a sect of Judaism. It's a fulfillment of Judaism. And as the doors are open, Gentiles are coming into relationship with the one true God of Israel through these people. 
You see, later on in history, it sort of changed where, where our faith is, was, is, was, was sort of uh, stripped of its vestiges of Judaism and became Christian, and then Christian tradition sort of took over, and, and most of the time we're not considered a sect of Judaism. You know, we, we really aren't, but if you really think about it, if you really think about it, if you identify with Peter, with James, with John, whoever the early founders of our faith are, it was Jewish people who came to faith in Messiah and opened the doors, like Peter did in Caesarea Maritime and, and other places, and said, come and join. And Paul describes it in Romans 11 as wild olive branches being grafted in amongst the nat natural olive branches. Okay, so that's my little spiel to, to, to tell you why we would have a Hanukkah menorah in a Christian church. Because there's something I feel that's rich in our heritage of faith. If we, I'm not saying worship the thing, I'm not saying make it an obligation, but to really understand what it is about our heritage. And that's so important for particularly the, the high holidays like Passover and others. So what about Hanukkah? Hanukkah, you know, it's not a primary feast. Um, some people, if you have Jewish friends, they might say, well, it's not really talked about much in synagogue like, you know, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, Pesach. But, you know, we, we light a Hanukkah menorah. And what about Jesus? What did Jesus do? Well, Jesus, as you know, he only went where he was supposed to be at the time. I believe Jesus was directly in God's timing all the time. If Jesus was in a place, it's not just because he happened to wander there aimlessly or arbitrarily. He was there for a purpose. And in, that, in John 10, we see where Jesus was and what he was doing. John 10, 22 says this. Then came the festival of dedication. What's the festival of dedication? It's Hanukkah, okay? The festival of dedication. Hanukkah means dedication. Then came the festival of Hanukkah at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. And the Jews who were gathered around him were saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And then Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But, but you do not believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, they follow me. I give them eternal life and they don't perish. And no one will snatch them from my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And then he makes a statement in John 10, 30, which is a, a powerful statement, probably one of the most pinnacle statements that he made. Right here in Hanukkah, right at the temple colonnade, he says this to them, I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. Well, that completely threw them into a rage. They, they picked up stones. They wanted to stone him right there and then. They wanted to kill him right there and then. But they didn't. But what they did do was start a serious plot to kill him very soon after. That was in John chapter 10. In uh, John chapter 11, uh, we see that the Pharisees put a plan into place to kill Jesus. In John chapter 12, Jesus recognizes that instead of running and hiding back in Galilee, he rides boldly into Jerusalem on a donkey, Palm Sunday. And that marked the beginning of the end for Jesus because he knew if he was to do that, a week later, he, less than a week later, he'd be on the cross. And as we, in our tradition, a week later, he's rising from the dead. So right away, as soon as he makes this statement, I and the Father are one, he set into motion a plan from the Pharisees that he knew they would do. It got him killed. It got him crucified. It got him sacrificed for our sins. And so he did this during Hanukkah. You think, why wouldn't he do it at Passover? Why wouldn't he do it at another time? But he did this during Hanukkah. And it was just months before he was on the cross. The truth is this, is that being one with the Father has everything to do with him celebrating light. And why do I say that? Hanukkah, as much as we know it as the, as the festival of dedication, it's also the festival of light. That's why we celebrate the Hanukkah lights. And, and when you think about Jesus, on this time period, in this day, it's winter as you saw in John 10, we don't know when Jesus was born. <laughs> but it's possible he was born around the 25th of Kislev. Um, some people say no, it was spring. Some other people say no, it was fall. But we don't know when Jesus was born. But it could be that he was born during the darkest time of the year. Because in the darkness, 
comes the light. Here comes the light. And he is the light of the world. And that's why when I look at the Christmas stories, I love the Christmas story in Luke, where the angels come to the shepherds and they, they were watching their fields by night and say, good times a great joy. I love that. I love Matthew when you see a little bit more of the, 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 the story narratives leading up to it and Mary, the angel. I love that. But I love John's story of Christmas as well. The Gospel of John. He doesn't mention any manger. He doesn't mention the shepherds. He doesn't mention the angels. And he doesn't mention Bethlehem. He does it this way. And he says it this way. John 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And listen, he says, and in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In verse 9, it says, the true light gives light to everyone, now has come into the world. And it's interesting, because you think about that darkness, that stillness, not just the darkness of night, not just the darkness because Israel is in this same type of uh, seasonal darkness as we are. They, they're um, part of you know northern hemisphere. But think about the darkness that Jesus was born into. The darkness of having the Roman Empire permeate the world, of all the world as you, you could possibly imagine. You probably could never get out of its grip. It was so vast. And the grip was, was powerful. You know, the Roman Empire eventually did take over around 60-something BC from the Greeks. And, and they were, they were brutal. They crucified tens of thousands of people, mostly Jews, in Judea. Jesus was just one of them. And, and they made it almost like a, what they call a vassal state, but it was almost like, like planned slavery, where you could live there. If you were a Jewish farmer, you could live there, but you had to pay ridiculous amounts of taxes. Maybe you had 10 acres of figs, and they want seven of those acres, <laughs> or whatever. And so you were living in this bondage. And if you ever tried to, you know, cheat on your taxes, believe me, it wasn't just a slap on the wrist. You might find yourself in debtor's prison or, or crucified. So that was the Roman Empire. Heavy-handed, brutal. And then underneath that, if that wasn't enough, they put someone in place, a Hasmonean, by the name of Herod the Great. First it was Herod Antipas, and then it was Herod the Great during the time of Jesus. Later it was Herod Archelaus, and and Herod Agrippa, but Herod the Great, another paranoid, brutal dictator who was named King of the Jews. He wasn't even technically Jewish, but he was there to keep the Jewish kingdom together so the taxes kept coming up to Rome. As long as he did that by force, they would leave him alone. If he stopped doing that, then he would suffer the same hands, the same fate as you and I would if we stopped paying taxes to Caesar. And then even underneath him, there was another layer of corruption, the priesthood. If you and I were, were Jewish people living in those days and we wanted to worship the one true God, you know, maybe very earnestly and humbly, you wanted to worship, worship God, what would you do? You probably wouldn't start a Bible study and have a church like this. You'd be required, as I said before, to go to the temple and offer your sacrifice three times a year. And what would you see when you got to Jerusalem? There's only one temple, it was in Jerusalem. You'd see a corrupt priesthood who was, who was out to try to extort money from you. You may have traveled from Galilee. You may have traveled days and days and brought your turtle doves for an offering, and they would say, oh, no, those are not acceptable. You need to buy turtle doves from us and go to the money, money changer and change your denarii into shekelim or shekels and get, and before you know it, they're just robbing you blind and laughing all the way to the bank, and all in the name of the one true God, in the name of the Father, at the temple. Are you with me? So this is all they had. This is all you would have. You didn't have a pocket Bible. You, you had the Torah, the Tanakh, right? Which is the Torah, the writings of the... The Tanakh is the... You, if you were with us the last couple Sundays in the morning, the, the Tanakh is what? It's, a, it's, an, it's an acronym. Tanakh. Tanakh. The Torah, which is the writings of, Noah, Noah, of Moses. The Nuvaim, which is the prophets. And the Kadavim, which is the writings. You have Moses, prophets... Things like Psalms of Prophets. And that's all you had, but you didn't have one in your, in your back pocket or in your barn or in your house. It was only in the synagogues, and it was read and studied in the temple. So my point is this. is just to get close to God, you have to go through layers of corruption, get robbed blind, and then you can go back to work, and you had to do that three times a year. That's all we had. 
But Jesus was changing all that. When he, when he was born, a light came into the world. A light in this dark, dark world. Darker than we have it right now, folks, I believe, because we have so much of Jesus in the world today. They didn't then. Um, think about what it would be like if he didn't come. Think about what life would be like 2,000 years later if there was no Jesus. It would have got more and more evil and more and more corrupt. I don't even know if the world would still be here, if mankind would exist. But Jesus was the one true light that came into the world. He came into the world. John 1, 14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelled among us, the light of the world. And it's really beautiful. He came into the world in a very dark time. You may say, well, it's dark now with, the, you know, with so much corruption and so much, you know, um, sin and lust and greed running rampant, and it is, and I'm not gonna deny that. But you, just the fact that Jesus was born, Herod the Great, as they say, was so paranoid that there, was, there may possibly be someone who's gonna take his place. When he heard from the wise men that, you know, there's a prophecy that the, the king, the real king of the Jews is gonna be born in Bethlehem, he was brutal enough to kill all the baby boys two years old and under just bloodshed. The holy innocence, as they're called. That is the world that Jesus was born into, a dark, dark world. The prophecy about Jesus being born was way before he was born. 700 years before he was born. Isaiah writes a beautiful Christmas scripture. Probably the most popular Christmas scripture in the Old Testament comes from Isaiah 9, 6, which is for unto us a child is born, right? But right before that, that's, that's, chapter, that's verse 6 in chapter 9. Verse 2 in chapter 9 describes it as this way. It says this, The people walking in darkness, Isaiah 9, 2, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Of those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Isn't that beautiful? This is a prophecy about what it would be like when, when the true light comes. Once again, this is the festival of the lights, and Jesus is the light of the world. And then, four verses later, it says, Unto us a child is born, a son is given, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, and the Everlasting, uh, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. So when Jesus was born, he was the light of the world. Changed history forever. All of a sudden, there's hope. All, all of a sudden, there's, there could be goodness in the world. That's why the angels announced there's good tidings of great joy. For unto us today is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. If you could really try to put yourself in that position of being a shepherd, most likely a Jewish shepherd in a Jewish town called Bethlehem. And wow, light is coming into the world. Hope is entering into the world. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. And then there was a wonderful story about when Jesus was born, they, they took him to get circumcised on the eighth day, and then they took him to get consecrated uh, in Jerusalem. Because let's remember what I said, he had to go through all the Jewish stuff, right? If he's going to be the Jewish Messiah, he's got to really, even his parents had to really abide by the rules. And in Luke 2, there's this beautiful story of an old man named Simeon. This old man named Simeon who, who was just waiting to die, but he didn't want to die until he saw the light, until he saw the long-awaited Messiah. And he was waiting, 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 and late in life, it says in Luke 2, 25, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Imagine God told you that, and you were one of these old Jewish guys at the temple, and you go every day, and you'd see if it was him, and you're getting older and older and older, and you wonder if that prophecy is really going to happen or not, you know? And then it happened. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents, Joseph and Mary, brought the child Jesus uh, to do for him what's customary in the law to do, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. And here's what he said. Sovereign Lord... As you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Remember Jesus' name, salvation. Which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation has come to the Gentiles and a glory to your people. When, si when Simeon took this child in his arms, he saw the light of the world. Jesus is our salvation. He is our light. Without him, our lives are, are destined for darkness. 
And each one of us is subject to the, to the who I talk about often, the, the thief that comes to kill and steal and destroy. Kill and steal and destroy you. And if it wasn't for Jesus, he would have his way. But because of Jesus, we have abundant life. We have the light of life in us. The light of life. Don't take it for granted, folks. When you look in the mirror sometimes, look deep into your eyes. Your eyes are the windows of the soul. And, and just see the light that's in there. That's the light of life. John 8, 12 says this, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do you have the light of life? I believe you do if you call upon the name of the Lord. We have that, that you have to be honest though, sometimes we're not walking in the light. Sometimes our, the, our steps are not illuminated because we, st we veer off the path so far, and we have a tendency to gravitate towards darkness from time to time, and we miss out on fellowship. That's why I want to encourage you to, to understand that Jesus is the light. And, and as much as we're able to give our hearts to him, submit our way and our path to him, we'll walk into the light. First John 1, 5 gives us somewhat of a warning. He says this, this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Walk in the light as he is in the light, and two things happen. He forgives us of our sin, obviously, but we have fellowship with one with another. You know, if we are huddled in darkness, if we gravitate towards our dark corners and try to hide in the shadows, we're not going to have much fellowship, are we? But as you and I come out of those corners, come out of the dark, and, and do what we're doing now, coming together to fellowship, to worship the Lord, and to hear His Word. We're walking in the light. Light is being poured into you. You know, it's like one of those, um, those glow-in-the-dark, you know, figurines or the things that you used to have, you know, and you put it next to a light bulb, and you know what? It stays. It, go into your dark bathroom or somewhere in, in your basement. You can see it, it, it glows in the dark. You know what I'm talking about? But the same thing, if you just hide it in, in a dark place, it's not going to glow so well. But it always will if you put it next to the, the sun or light bulb. We're like that, folks. As we expose ourselves to the Spirit of God, as we look into His Word and do His Word, as we worship the Lord, as we come together and do some one another in it, we're like that iridescent or whatever you call it, material, that glow in the dark material. And we get filled with light, and the light comes out of us. Hanukkah is the festival of lights. It's the perfect time to ask the light of the world to come into our lives, if you if it's never had before and illuminate the darkness that may exist. It's also the Feast of Dedication, and it's a perfect time to dedicate our life to the Lord. If you've never given your life to the Lord, if you've never dedicated your life to Jesus, I'd love to talk to you afterwards and lead you in a prayer where He can be the light inside you, and you no longer are running into the darkness, but you have light pouring from you and coming into you. And that's what it is when the light of the world comes into us. So, that's my challenge as a church, let's dedicate ourselves during this Hanukkah to walking into the light, walking in the light this coming season, and also not just storing it up for ourselves, but sharing it with the world that is so desperately in need of light and is still walking in darkness. Amen.